In this video, we're going to be looking at how to model the bilateral monopoly situation. So we begin by putting down the normal axes that we would use for labor market wage determination. We have the real wage rate on the y-axis and the quantity of labor on the x-axis. And just like whenever we model the supply and demand of labor, we would say that the demand of labor, which is the marginal revenue product, is downward sloping. And the supply of labor, which is to say the minimum price you have to pay to entice workers into the market, would be upward sloping. Now, the fact that it's a bilateral monopoly means that the buyer of the labor is a monopsonist. We can assume that there is one firm who is purchasing all the labor in this market. What that means is the monopsonist is going to have a marginal factor cost curve, which has a steeper gradient than the supply curve of labor. You should be familiar with this, but the reason why it is is because to employ each additional unit of labor, the monopsonist then has to pay all the other people that it's already hired a higher wage, and so therefore the, the factor cost, the cost of, of, of all their wages, is the, the marginal factor cost is going to be higher and higher the more, the more workers you employ. The profit-maximizing monopsonist will then decide, well, they want to employ the number of workers where the marginal factor cost equals the marginal revenue product. That's at this point here, and they will therefore hire L0 number of workers. Now, in order to get that many workers, they look at the supply of labor curve, the minimum price paid to entice workers into that market, and they will therefore pay the wage W0. So this, is, this, is the, this model as it looks here is what would happen if we had the monopsony diagram. And if we didn't have any other influences, the monopsonist would pay at W0 and hire L0. But the fact that it's a bilateral monopoly means that we've got, on the one hand, the monopsonist, the monopoly of, of which is the firm buying all the labor, but we're now going to introduce a monopoly selling the labor. And to, to think about the monopoly selling the labor, we're going to say that there's a trade union which acts and represents all the workers as a single u unit, which we would then therefore would say is a monopoly. Now, any monopoly can choose where they want to set their price and how much they want to sell along the demand curve for their product. When they're doing that, like we've seen before in monopolies for ledger markets, we'd also want to look at the marginal revenue that the monopoly is going to make. So this marginal revenue of labor curve, as I've called it, is going to describe the marginal increase in the total, the total wage packet paid to all members um, given any quantity of labor that they're hiring. And and because the supply of labor curve represents that minimum wage to entice people into the market, the monopoly is actually going to be looking at this as their marginal cost curve as well. And so if the, if the trade union wants to maximize their economic rent, just like a monopoly, they will choose the quantity where the marginal cost equals the marginal revenue, which is right there. So they would say that they're going to higher or they would they would set a wage where they're going to hire L2 and because it's a because they're a monopoly of this trade union the the wage that's set is actually set on this point on the demand curve which is up there so if the if the trade union got involved they could possibly set a wage as high as W2 now this is assuming that the trade union wants to maximize the economic rent for their members if they have another objective, which is to say they want to maximize the number of workers who are working in the trade union, then they wouldn't produce a W2, L2. They would actually produce where supply equals demand. This is the maximum number of workers that can work, which is L1. And to get to L1, they would therefore demand a wage rate of W1. Now, this is as far as the economics can get us. It tells us the possible, the range of possible wages that will happen depending on who has the relative strength in the negotiating process. If the, if the monopsonist employer has more bargaining power, then the wage is going to be closer to the original wage W0 um, than, it, than it would be um, higher up the, the, the range. Whereas if the trade union has greater bargaining power, then it's going to be closer to W2 or W1, depending on what the trade union's objectives are. So 
The use of this diagram is very useful because what you want to be able to do is show the monopsony diagram and then say, well, with collective bargaining, with a trade union involved, we're going to see the, the, the wage push up from W0 um, to W1, possibly as high as W2, but really no higher than W2. Anything in that range is, is possible. So I hope you found that helpful. Good luck when you model that on your own.